Okay, so I'll start with a general introduction where we want to go. So in previous lectures, we kind of built the technology. What is the idea CFT? Where it comes from? Uh, you know how it works. Um, so yeah, here we're going to start with the questions we want to answer first, and then I will introduce uh, the framework of holographic cosmology, and then I'll give you an overview. First, I'll give you the general ideas, um, what sort of things one w w wish to uh, uh, answer, and what sort of things we already get, even without doing any computation, just the theoretical, uh, just using the theoretical framework. And then we're gonna zoom in to discuss what things have been computed, give you a little bit of an overview, and then I'll finish with work which is happening right now. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, I mean, one of the things that humanity wondered for years was how do we come here? Where do we come? Where is, is, is there a beginning of time? What are the laws of physics at the initial singularity? And uh, I mean, we're out here observing galaxies. And in the last, uh, let's say, 30, 40 years, we have been observing kind of the, uh, the after, afterglow of the Big Bang uh, and getting more and more information. Um, but is there something we know Einstein, Einstein's relativity breaks down at uh, time zero, but is there something before that? Uh, can we even formulate the laws of physics if there's no concept of space and time the way we perceive them today? Um, these are things when I was a graduate student, there were things we would discuss after a couple of beers late in the night, and maybe we're going to stay till the morning debating this, this kind of questions. Um, and for a long time, I thought this is where this question is below. This is more like metaphysics rather than physics. You kind of, it's good for motivation, but there's very little you can do. Uh, but now I think we start actually to move to have a scientific debate where we have the questions and uh, we can draw conclusions. So start this type of questions start to become part of actual science, not uh, motivation and inspiration. Uh, and I think for me, if anything, that's the biggest contribution. You know, the models I will discuss today may turn out to roll out. Uh, you will see this is how they do when they compare to data. It may turn out to be rolled out, but they bring much closer to the, the, the models that you actually quantitatively can address this type of issues. Uh, <clears throat> and suppose we can answer this, we can have a model, then you can ask, are they observational signals from that period? Can we zoom in and say, is our theory correct or wrong? Okay, so uh, the way I will discuss this, I will first uh, start by introducing this framework of holographic cosmology. Uh, and then I will uh, tell you what things you can draw, even without doing pretty much by just using the general principles of holography without doing much computation. And then we'll zoom in again to do computation, uh, compare with data, and then uh, this part two is more kind of recent stuff. Uh, where, um, um, uh, I have been working with lattice gauge theories to work out the consequences of holographic cosmology. So it's called, we call it lattice holographic cosmology. And uh, we can already address some of the questions I was discussing earlier, like how do you resolve the initial singularity and so on. This is still in progress. You see how far we are, and then we will conclude. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. So first and foremost, holographic cosmology is a new framework. Um, a few days ago, I was in Pune, and uh, Sunil Muki gave a colloquium about string theory. And uh, he started discussing, you know, we have frameworks and models. And uh, a framework is either useful or not. It's not falsifiable. Because it's a framework, it's so you can one model can work, another may not. Models are the ones which are falsifiable. So I will discuss first the framework, and then I will discuss models. The models will be falsifiable with data. Actually, 
they, they could have already rolled out and they survived testing with data over the last 10 years and there's smart tasks you can do. But I think the framework, if the idea of holography, the way we understand it today is the right idea, the framework is here to stay. Um, so in this framework, R for and also, I mean, yes, in, 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 on Tuesday we discussed ADS. Okay, our universe is not ADS. ADS is a universe with negative cosmological constant. So this talk is entirely about our own universe. Try to use these ideas to model our own universe. So for this reason, I will almost entirely stay within a four dimensional universe because we know there are four macroscopic. Uh, dimensions. So in this framework, uh, our four-dimensional universe is described, will be described by three-dimensional quantum field theory with no gravity. And uh, to discuss predictions, you need also to have a dictionary. So now instead of starting with a traditional way, which is for the Einstein gravity, you say I uh, have gravity coupled to matter, you solve Einstein equations, so you have your model, and then you work out the predictions, and then you compare with data. So here you start from a different perspective. You, you, your, your starting point is not Einstein gravity coupled to matter. The starting point is a three-dimensional quantum field theory. So you classify your models by the type of quantum field theories you could consider. But then you need to have the dictionary to uh, that will allow you to go from quantum kind of field theory observables to cosmological observables. So this, this new framework includes conventional inflation, so a class of quantum kind of field theories discuss uh, kind of, uh, uh, are, are about conventional inflation. But for me, more importantly, allows for qualitatively new models which describe a non-geometric non very early universe. And for me, this is more important because it allows to go back and again put into science this type of what one may have perceived metaphysical questions. I mean, when we go back in time, you know gravity suddenly became strongly coupled at some point. So you suddenly have to go outside the framework of uh, Einstein gravity coupled to matter. And that could be string theory, a strongly coupled uh, string theory model. But we have already had 30, 40 years of work in that area, and that's very difficult to make anything quantitative. So hologram gives another means to produce models which are not qualitative, they're quantitative. And you would say they're very, very precise. So, so it could have been, if this would be a series of lectures, I would have devoted one lecture in discussing how conventional inflation is embedded within this framework. Uh, but today I'm only going to have a comment here and there. I will mostly focus on these new models, these non-geometric non, non models. Okay, so why would you want to do that? Well, first is a much bigger framework and automatically buys you a lot of things. I mean, the models are fully consistent with quantum mechanics because it's just based on standard quantum field theory. Uh, general relativity emerges when the quantum field theory dynamics become strongly interacting. Uh, that's in the holography paradigm. These models are well defined when traditional general relativity breaks down. And you will see it explicitly, including when the initial, including at the initial singularity. So you know exactly what are the laws of physics at that point. As I will also argue, this automatically gives you also uh, an explanation, has a natural explanation of the arrow of time, which is something that it has been debated over the years. Um, why do we perceive one direction of time? Um, and then uh, also provides an excellent fit to CMB data. If you compare it with what we see, it, 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 it works very well. So let me just give you a, a feel of that. Okay, so that's from 2015, uh, sorry, 2017, from two papers I wrote with, uh, with cosmologists. Um, so here in this graph, 
this is the kind of the usual graph that you see when people discuss CMP. So there are two curves here. There is the traditional lambda CDM, which is uh, blue dotted, and there are predictions of these new models, which I will de define more accurately later in the talk. And uh, this is this uh, this red curve, and these are the Planck data. But uh, first, with the eye, you don't see the two curves; they're on top of each other. Uh, secondly, this region here will become important later on. These are the low multiple regions, and this is blown up here. And uh, over here, you can see what the, this, uh, this 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 block is. This this part here blown up yeah. and again the, the, the same code kind of lambda cdm is this curve holographic cosmology is this one uh, and then from the data you can see there is this little dip here in the data so this is called uh, large angle anomaly so there's no current model that this is this says that lambda cdm is has about two sigma discrepancy with data because of this little dip down there um, and we want to kind of go back and start discussing that uh, also again towards the end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's right here. So here we want to use holography in the opposite direction. We want to understand strongly coupled gravity by using weakly coupled color field theory. So the second part we discuss uh, also uh, in the first lecture was the so-called UV IR connection, which means that the UV the on the field theory is the IR of gravity and vice versa. And again, historically, <coughs> it was mostly used in the way I wrote it here. So uh, we wanted to understand uh, if anomalies with the quantum field theory or uh, how the normalization of the quantum field theory happens from the perspective of gravity. And this was holographic normalization and we just started developing the opposite. But here again, we're going to use it the other way around. So the UV of gravity is the singularity, you probing the UV of gravity. So that should be related with the IR of the quantum field theory. And finally, the holographic direction is associated with the energy scale of the quantum field theory. So if I want to put this in a graph, so if this is ADS, that's the boundary of ADS, uh, <coughs> then Moving in the radial direction is captured by normalization group flow. And as you go from high energies to low energies, there is a cross graining. So what you might start with three apples here, in, it might look like one glary apple in the IR. So there's a cross graining degrees of freedom. And this, uh, this flow is monotonic. Okay, so um, it says that's since a standard ADS CFT stuff. So now we're gonna see how all of this are modified when we try to apply that to cosmology. So in holographic cosmology, now the direction which is which emerges is the time direction. And cosmological evolution is inverse serialization group flow. So in standard ADS CFT, as you go to the interior. So radial evolution is a normalization group flow, where in cosmology, as you start from the big bang and go forward in time, this is inverse of G flow. So here it is in the graph again. So this is the big bang. And we know that in the big bang, gravity was strongly coupled. And as we move forward in time, gravity becomes more and more weakly coupled. I mean, right now we have very weak curvature in the solar system and so on. Uh, yes. Uh, so this RG flow is not a unitary evolution, but when we talk of time evolution, it's typically unitary. And that's one main conceptual difference. But of course, uh, maybe in this kind of setups, you need to do some post selections on the final state, which makes it again non-unitary. So it's actually, uh, uh, when you do this inversion, there is a subtlety, right? When you think about this energy continuation from radial flow to time. No, I mean, there are definitely conceptual differences, but it's also, uh, in a sense, conceptual difference in the way the problem is set up. So over here, so the future, suppose we know, I mean, changes the, 
what we think we can learn from the things now. So if, you, if, you, if you're here, if you're a gravity person, you would say I give initial data on that surface, and then I will use Einstein equations to involve that to the future, right? That's what we'd say. Now, this framework here says that uh, this will never be a completely accurate description un unless you give uh, a completely fine-tuned initial data. So if I give a data here, it's like giving the, the theory at some energy scale. So if you want to go upwards in the RG flow, then uh, this means that you really have to fine-tune initial data to know in a sense where it's going to go. But if we know the theory at this scale, this means we know everything to, its, to, 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 to the infrared, to its past. So at any given time in history, we were able to post-dict what happened in the past, but we only have uh, a finite resolution of how things are going to evolve in the future. And if I come and tell you what is the ultimate theory of the universe, tell you the UV theory, if I postulate, then I can predict everything in the past. So it's, it's, it, I mean, it changes conceptually the way we view kind of time evolution. Yeah, my comment was simply exactly what you're saying, that if only when you view it from the time way, if you do some, if you're going back in time, like doing the post-diction, then you're basically always doing some pre-selection, which is uh, post-selection, which is, makes the flow not unitary, I mean, which makes the time, the, the map not a unitary map, which is exactly what is also happening in the larger case. So, it's, so okay, so that resolves to be this. But, I mean, I think this is a feature, not, 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 not the problem. So here, uh, you know, the arrow of time, um, I think that's what gives the arrow of time. So in the sense, the coarse graining and also, so what did people say in the past about the arrow of time? People said that the arrow of time is, of the thermodynamic origin. And we have the sense that we move in time because of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, if you start from our perspective, then one can ask why was then the entropy of the initial state so low? So you have to do a, a kind of, a, you have to fine tune your theory to start with a low entropic state so that uh, we reach, so after the time evolution, we reach to the entropy that we have now. This, uh, this idea says that the initial state is generic, just from the universality of quantum field theory. And then the initial conditions are natural, are not fine-tuned. And then the, uh, the cost graining you see on, on the quantum field theory just encodes as the fact that as you go to the UV, you have more degrees of freedom. That's the increase with the entropy. And the, uh, the monotonicity of the RG flaw is, gives you the monotonicity of the hour of time. So I, I, I don't think, um, in a sense, in time dependent context, I mean, unitarity has to be revisited in, uh, in a time dependent context. There is, of course, unitarity in the sense that the quantum field theory is a proper quantum system that preserves probabilities and so on. But from the back perspective, now you have to put this through the lens of the dictionary to see what implies for our space time. And so the puzzles that we have, why do we have an hour of time, what happens to the, why the entropy is this or that, uh, that's more difficult to understand from a back perspective, but they become more natural once you view them from the perspective of the, uh, of the dual theory. Yes, the same here, but I would say uh, the, the argument goes all gravity sh should have a dual because yeah. the original argument of you know, Toft and Susskind did not rely on uh, any of the specific properties of gravity, just rely on the existence of black holes. And all theories of gravity that we know have black holes. And as long as you have a black hole, then the theory should be holographic. So there should be a quantum field theory behind it. What we don't know is the exact nature of the quantum field theory. Yes, so here, what I will uh, be able to describe later today is the very early universe, the period which is usually associated with inflation. Uh, but I do not know, I do not have good models to describe 
the subsequent evolution where you, you know, have radiation domination, matter domination. Then I have again a good model when it goes to dark energy. I will have maybe a slide to do uh, in, in a minute. Yeah, so what I was exactly saying that, of course, even in the laboratory, whether you have some, not all physical channels are mutually. For example, if you do compost selection on the final state, then of course, uh, the way you pose the question. So here, uh, one has to, like you said, I mean, one has to be careful about the way you're posing the questions on both sides. Yes, 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 yes. But I mean, by the same time, I'm also saying that, so what is many things which are very natural from the boundary perspective explain things which are looks puzzling from the bulk perspective. One buys a lot of kind of theoretical mileage with very little just on the generic principles of holography. Yes. Well, I mean, it is related in the sense uh, it builds on the same ideas. The technical details are a little bit different. I would say, I would say this is the way DSCFT should be done. Um, then I would say then it is yes CFT. It says the original formulation was not uh, at the technical level. It was not exactly what I was describing. But what I'm describing works also for DS CFT, and it works and gives can describe arbitrary inflationary model, which was in a sense what they wanted to do early on. So in that sense, this is the SCFT. It's not, it's not uh, separate, it's not different proposal. That's how it works technically. Okay, but here, in a sense, you, you have to view it as, no, but you have to view it from the perspective of the dual theory, not from the perspective of gravity. Yeah. So from the perspective of the dual theory, as I got to the IR, uh, okay, it's, uh, there are only very few possibilities. And uh, the, the, the more natural one, uh, it's, it's either it's gapped or it has an infrared fixed point. I would, I would say both of them might accommodate the very early, the very early universe. Um, and that's actually that slide over here, yes, yes. But, but, that's, but that's on the gravity, right? That's on the gravity. Okay, so uh, why are you on the talk on Monday? Oh, no, sorry, not Monday, on the first one. So in the first one, uh, one of the things I was explaining is what happens to the, so if, if you look at uh, the UV structure of uh, let's say effective filter, you have an infinite number of couplings. Now, if you have a UV completion, these are fixed by the UV complete theory, like string theory. So now from a perspective of the dual theory, so the UV structure mapped to the IR, and then the IR is uniquely predicted by, by the UV. So in a sense, in, in the, you, you're under much better control. Um. <clears throat> yes. Monotonicity is there for quantum field theories. If we have quantum field theory coupled to gravity, we don't really, uh, you need quantum theories of gravity to address that. Okay, so in a sense, okay, now going back to in a sense very early and very late universe. And another thing that you get automatically in a very natural way is dark energy. We know we live in a period of uh, dark energy, and we know that quantum field theories have a natural structure in the UV and the IR. So, uh, so the UV could be a strongly coupled UV fixed point, and that could correspond to a positive cosmological constant. Or it could be a strongly coupled, supernormalizable quantum field theory, which would correspond to kind of a model of quintessence. And the IR, one can again naturally have an IR fixed point. That would correspond to the Sitter type inflation. Or it could correspond to a theory of the type of the theory I will describe um, later, which is described by supernormalizable theory. And that corresponds 
in the regime of gravity is weakly coupled to power law inflation. So in more or less, in a sense, what we see about what now and in our past is also in broad agreement with what you expect from, uh, from, from the duality. So that's another qualitative feature. Um, <clears throat> so how do we compute? Okay, I said earlier that uh, Maldasena had this reformulation in terms of a wave function of the universe, and that's how we describe it here, even though that's not exactly the way we set it up 10 years ago, but I think conceptually that probably gives the, the kind of, it's, it is, is the right picture. So the way holography works in this cosmological setup is that the partition function of the quantum field theory becomes equal to the wave function of the universe. So on the quantum field theory side, these phi's are the sources that couple the gauge invariant operators. And on the left hand side, these are the initial values for the fields for the time evolution. So again, if I go to this picture, so if I have slides here, so now the traditional perspective is, you know, we need to give so the three metric and initial conditions on that slice. And this piece of data is exactly the sources for the dual operators. Uh, you, you don't need some. Uh, you don't. You do not need uh, to, to get some values at spatial infinity. Actually, typically, like the sitter doesn't have spatial infinity; only has time-like infinity. So you need to give the values at future infinity. That that's the, the, the prescription. So now, once you have a wave function, then the way to compute cosmological observables is using the standard quantum mechanics. So you square the wave function. And then you compute expectation values of operators with measure given by the square of the wave function. So now uh, <coughs> the partition function has an expansion in correlation functions. So it's, it's given by an exponential of a sum of terms, which are the, the correlators multiplied by the sources. So now you can take this, put it here, and then put it there, and work this out. And this gives formulas for the cosmological observables in terms of correlation functions of this theory. Uh, so now next I'm gonna, is it next? Yes. So I'm gonna show you this, this formulas for the uh, power spectrum and just sketch them for, well, just mention them for non-Gaussianities. We actually could compute them in a different way, but, uh, and now this is gonna take me too far away to, tell you how to or initially compute them. I'm just going to give you instance the prescription. So, uh, so if you have a two-point function of the energy momentum tensor in momentum space, then uh, just on symmetry grounds, this has the form indicated over here. So there is a piece, which is uh, the transverse traceless part of the correlator. So this capital pi is a projection to the transverse traceless piece. And there's another piece which is the trace trace part of the correlator. So now you're given a theory, like the one I will give you in a few minutes, then you compute the two-point function, then you extract A and B, and then the power spectrum, the holographic formula is given here. So you take the B coefficient, and then to that coefficient, you do a specific analytic continuation. So you take the magnitude of the momentum, and you rotate them to the negative imaginary axis. And if this is an SUN theory, like it is usually in many of the dualities we discuss, then you take N and you rotate in the same way. Now, why these are the right analytic combinations? It's, it's again uh, a longer discussion, comes more from the other way of doing the computation. This is slightly different from what Marduk now is doing. Yeah, so. Yes, so Maldasena was formulating the continuation using bulk quantities. Uh, now, in a paper that should appear in a few weeks, we explain it, that it's, the two are equivalent. Um, in a sense, what we wanted to have was we wanted to have a, a continuation which is intrinsic to the quantum field theory, makes no reference to the bulk. 
because then uh, it doesn't matter whether it's three level, one loop, two loops, it's just intrinsic to the quantum, really holographic. Because what he was doing was relying specifically on the specific backgrounds he was discussing. So there's nothing, in a sense, wrong with the formulas he had. Well, there is one little thing, I think, which is wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, huh? Uh, well, the, the, the center charges, that depends exactly on what, which conventions you're using. Um, if you look at my review on holographic normalization from 2002, I had an appendix. Yeah, yeah. I think the right side, uh, the, the right signs, you can get the right signs from there because I did both cases in parallel, ADS and the sitter, following all the signs, all the previous works where uh, hand wave a bit your hands, and I'm not sure that the signs were uh, all correct. But if you start from that perspective and you choose, con you, you, you pick your conventions, then you can get the right signs. Now, I don't remember, I mean, here we're not gonna discussing CFTs. So we're gonna discuss in this other class, but you can get the signs uh, from there. No, G and Mills will not be continued. Only, only the uh, the rank of the gauge group would be continued. There is no, uh, there is no. I, 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 I will go to the model in a minute. But I mean, all of this, this slide here is true for all duals. So that's what you need to do. If there is, there are cases where there are anomalies, like the one I was discussing yesterday. Then when you have an anomaly, then there would be a scale and the correlator associated with the anomaly, and you have to continue that with the same, uh, with the same prescription. Yes? Now, I mean, there is, the, 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 there are two classes of continuation, which roughly speaking is the one that we did, and the one that Maldosan uh, did, and these are equivalent, uh, the way we would, this, there's nothing else. Now we have classified the continuation. There's one continuation you can do. And one way of doing it is this one. Any other one can be mapped to this by a sequence of uh, transformations. So it's really N, it's not, it's not Yang Mills, yes, yes. It's really, it's really N. <coughs> so it is really, and it says you continue, affects the loops. It doesn't affect the uh, kind of alpha prime corrections. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so now starting from B, you can put it here, do the continuation, and then you get the power spectrum. And if you start with the A, then you're going to get the tensor power spectrum. Okay, so that's in a sense now if you want to have a picture in mind, this is the picture. So I will describe we have a non university a non-geometric universe, which at some point transitions to a geometric phase, which is our universe the way we see it now. Uh, that happens when interactions become very strong. Uh, so what, so would model, would be able to model this phase over here. So here, this place here is what you would call uh, time zero in uh, traditional kind of Big Bang cosmology. So ideally, one needs a reheating phase that smoothly transitions from here to there. This is something which is still missing. So I, I only have the toy model for that. Uh, so we are here. This is in a sense the universe after Big Bang, and then. Before that, that's what the theory is. So you have, in a sense, a timeless theory where it says the time evolution is inverse RG flow. Something just conceptual. Suppose, uh, maybe this is not useful for observation, but suppose I, if I go from in the infrared, I can choose some non trivial state. Mm -hmm. And how does it reflect uh, in this when we do this time evolution back and Suppose I use some equation particle prepared from... Some yes, particle. yes, yes. So that would in a sense have something which is different, let's say bunch davis vacuum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can in a sense go through the same steps that led to this ones, 
and there will be a modification. Uh, I think the formulas would be the same. It's just gonna be the, the, the A and B will now be computed in that state. So I don't think it would change conceptually the, 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 the picture. I think that's an interesting exercise. We actually put it, in the, at least in the first few papers, we always had a, a paragraph saying, you wanna do it in a different state. Now you need to uh, work more along the lines of this framework with what Baldwin reads. Um, okay, now, um, of course, uh, inflation was not originally proposed to describe the CMB because CMB had not even observed, even it was, it was only 10 years that we get the first COVID results. Inflation was originally proposed because there were puzzles with how Big Bang cosmology. Uh, that's this graph here. So, so if you had just uh, hot Big Bang cosmology, then okay, this would be equal, uh, equal to zero. But then we know that uh, no matter what we see in the sky, the, uh, the, the, the universe looks isotropic and homogeneous. And of course, with Planck, we know this is to unprecedented ac accuracy. Kind of fluctuations are extremely small. But now, if you start from here, you look backwards in time to the point where this was created. Then uh, these two points here, so it, you know, we are here, we look at opposite sides of the sky, see the radiation coming in, and they have the same temperature. But now these two points, if you look now at the past light cones, do not have enough time to interact. So now in, in hot big bang cosmology, this line here, which is now called reheating, this is the initial singularity. So the space time ends before these two points have time to interact. And then uh, there's clearly something has to change, right? The, 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 uh, our universe cannot just be hot big bang cosmology with some initial singularity. And that's what it is, you know like it or, or not. It's, it's clear it contradicts observations. So if there is one thing in the sense that uh, from this original puzzles, which is definitely true, is that one. And there is a puzzle about why the universe is as flat as we see it, or why we don't see any relics from uh, of the early universe. So the why inflation is all this, it says, okay, this line here is really not equal to zero, it's not initial time. And then you add another period before that, this inflationary period. And provided this is long enough, this is the condition of uh, the number of effaultings, 60, 70 effaultings. This means that everything that we see in the sky could have come from the same, the same region, could have been a causal contact. So, we see here the same temperature because these two points could have originated from the same region and these regions are in fuzzle context, provided inflation lasts long enough. Now that's a perfectly fine resolution, except that kind of moves the problem somewhere else. And then you can ask, what are the chances that our initial conditions are in this patch rather than kind of somewhere else? Uh, so, okay, it isn't such progress, but doesn't really re resolve it. And of course, inflation is also an effective theory. It doesn't tell us what happens at the being bang. And so as you say, okay, that, that's an issue for uh, the UV complete theory, string theory, whatever it is. Now, the say, so, the, the, so how does this work in, in holography? So in holography, as I told you, it's, um, this is the image. And what we do is, we measure correlators of the CFT at this kind of end of, this, in the, at the end of that period. And the correlators we need to measure are kind of the, the, the two point functions of the energy momentum pressure. So now let's first, in a sense, redo that side, because I told you that uh, this framework is not just uh, for the new models, it encompasses also inflation. So, uh, if you can describe inflation, it should have explained how that puzzle was, was resolved and 
what do the 60 fallings come from? So let's assume now that we have, uh, we describe inflation. So this region here is also has a geometric description. Now if you have a geometric description, then you can compute the two point function of, you can, have, uh, like you can approximate the two point function by a geodesics that start and end in that point. And it's very easy to, to see that uh, if you have the two points are distance L away, then the geodesics would probe, roughly speaking, distance L over two in the interior. And uh, so this means for, the, for this to be correlated, these two points to be correlated through a geometric means. This means that the space time should be weakly coupled roughly up to distance L over two, because then it makes sense to compute the geodesics in that space. And I can translate that uh, L over two into the number of the following and get back the user 60, 70. Uh, so that's necessary formulation of kind of, uh, what uh, Guth's uh, computation now in holography. But that computation now, it's easy to generalize in complete generality. So provided the theory doesn't have an infrared singularity, which we will see in the next few slides, it doesn't. And that's what uh, a solution of initial singularity is. No matter what these two points are, in the sense, you can go, you know, if, if this is not geometric, if, if you don't have the right number of foldings, still, st still the issue is resolved because uh, the space time can, can be computing going further and further down in, in the IR. So this shows that in a, in kind of a quantum theory of gravity, there's never an issue with, um, there's never a horizon problem. And in a sense, the horizon problem here, the number of foldings was, was just there because they wanted to resolve it geometrically. So if you want to resolve it geometrically, you need 60, 70 foldings. If you do have a well-defined theory of quantum gravity that can go into even high energies, it always gets resolved. So the, 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 the fact that it's resolved just comes from a, a standard kind of quantum field theory. If you have two points separated for some distance, then you may have to go very deep in the IR to see how they're connected. Uh, So the, 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 uh, yeah, on this side, uh, I am putting Bunch Davis. Yes. Well, I mean, on this side, Bunch Davis really corresponds to the standard trivial vacuum of the, of, of the kind of filter. You can do other things like when in, in Ion's question. Yes, yes. And then if you want to now describe uh, the, uh, the flatness question and the relics, these are also resolved by using properties of renormalization group law. And uh, yeah, I don't have the slides. If people want to see it, I have another talk with the slides. <laughs> um, FNL, uh, <clears throat> I will briefly, I don't have again the, the formulas, but we computed non gaussianity for arbitrary inflationary theory. And these non-geometric models have a very, very specific FNL, which I will describe in a few slides. Uh, I have one, one more question. Yes. Sure question. So here, the, how do we, this analytic contribution should naturally produce this uh, density type of horizon? Yeah, the horizons. So dependent horizons that uh, on this, uh, how do I see when I do this matching? And yeah, so the horizons, I mean, here in a sense, we, uh, the, the horizons are more non perturbative objects. And here I'm treating the, the theory perturbatively. Um, I, I, I don't have an understanding of you know, the temperature of the sitter or how this affects that discussion. That, that's an interesting question to, to, to further understand, yes. I mean, also for the, let's say, in, in the context of uh, inflation, you usually need the kind of the inflationary parts, right? Kind of the flat part, parts, where for uh, 
the conceptual issues of the city, you really, the global structure is, is more important. But it's definitely an interesting question, there's no question. Um, okay, so now, so this was the framework, right? Up to here, in a sense, everything they said applies to any model that one could think of. So now we're gonna m move on to, to discuss models. Okay, so then uh, the, the, <coughs> the general model I will discuss are general perturbative quantum field series that have massless scalars in gauge fields. Actually, the original papers also with the fermions, and we did computations also with the fermions, but it turns out that when combining with Planck, Planck rules out mostly fermionic models. So that also shows that the data is not only good enough to verify some models, they're also strong enough to rule out some models. If you have something falsifiable, it's clear, okay, here I, here I just falsify a model, kind of a gauge fields coupled to only fermions, is ruled out by data. Uh, it is very important that the fields are massless. It wouldn't fit the data without being massless, yes. Like yes. Not yes, I'm not changing. So, so the I'm uh, kind of modeling here, and then um, I give. So this gives. So the end of my computation gives initial conditions to that surface, and then I do an instant reheating. So that data is initial data for Einstein evolution afterwards, and then I evolve it to the end. Um, so ideally, I would have. Kind of a smooth transition, which I now have right now. Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so here this theory is super normalizable. It's not a CFT. It has a dimensional coupling constant. So Young Mills, the Young Mills coupling has dimension one, but it's still a special theory. It's more special than a generic theory. And what is special with that theory is apart from this dimensionful coupling, which is overall, there is no other dimensionful parameter. So all the other, uh, this lambda is dimensionless. And all fields, so if I assign kind of four dimensional dimensions, like dimension one to the gauge field, dimension one to a scalar, and uh, 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 then, then all terms have the same scaling. So this means that this theory, this has, an this is what is called a generalized conformal structure. And uh, even though that's not a bona fide symmetry, it still controls many of the properties of, of, of the model. So, the, the reason you're picking uh, this sort of thing instead of, for example, a Chen Simons thing or, or a. Yes, or yes. So, Chen so 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 Simons would be more appropriate to describe uh, kind of inflationary type models. So this model is appropriate to describe uh, um, and it has, has this generalized conformal structure. So this, is, this belongs to the family of uh, dualities associated with non-conformal brains. Yes. So the non-conformal brains have that property. They have a generalized conformal structure. And this Lagrangian has the same property. So this means we know the holographic dictionary for these models as well. So why does the phi to the plus six term doesn't come about? So the phi to the six term is irrelevant from the perspective of the generalized conformal structure. Even though it's normalizable in the usual counting, it is irrelevant from the perspective of the, uh, so it would be an irrelevant operator. Actually, I, I said uh, I have a toy model describing this transition. Mm -hmm. That toy model is putting in a phi to the six. So if you put a phi to the six, that's, that changes the UV of the theory because it's an irrelevant operator from the perspective of the generalized conformal structure. And what it does is generates an RG flow for lambda. And then uh, the hope is that this RG flow would now, uh, this, this coupling would now run to strong coupling. And that's how you get into uh, the um, geometric regime. 
but I have only done this computation perturbatively, uh, and it's, it's an uh, inverse RG flow, so it's not, uh, it's not easy to go beyond it, but okay, that, that, that's the idea. And, and vector models uh, will, be, will be like higher spins, uh, so, so, so. so high spins, that's another very interesting question, and it is in my list of the things to do. So this, these are non-geometric models. So this means, from the string theory perspective, you expect a uh, highly curved space-time, and uh, we and we know string theory contains high spin uh, states, and this model here also has uh, uh, weakly broken high spin currents because you know if I put lambda to zero, it's a free theory, and uh, the standard kind of high spin currents in 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 the theory, and working out the observational consequences of that. It's 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 a definite definitely a very interesting problem. We just haven't gotten around to do it yet. So. <laughs> but, but we always have lambda in, in what you're. I was going to have lambda. Yes, it's, they're always going to be broken. So, so you're basically going to organize everything in, in, in terms of the zero Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> this is the dual to the IR of the gravity. Uh, sorry, this this is dual to the. Uh, uh, very early universe, so I wouldn't call it. So it would be UV at the end. When we got to the singularity, it would be UV. Yes. Yeah, so here, uh, okay. The ADS, kind of the holographic computation, would, is done in a very similar way to uh, kind of ADS CFT, but now and this has extended to uh, the knock of my brain. So I, I okay. developed that uh, 15 years ago. So that's what we're using. So it's, not a CFT it's not a CFT boundary condition. Yes, yes. But it's very similar. I mean, the framework is not, uh, it's, it's roughly speaking the same steps. Um, let me see, when is a good time for a break? Whenever you think. We have I think now, in a sense, we're starting a new topic. Maybe it is a good time to have okay, a break so now. So let's yeah? have a break then.